Well, welcome to Bible study today. We're going to look at two psalms about family. And we're going to be looking at physical family, biological family, and how God urges us to build our individual families. And we're going to look at our spiritual family, the family of God. You always think of Abraham and his many sons and how we are part of the family tree of Abraham. And even as Gentiles, we've been engrafted into that family. So let's get right into the psalm today. Uh, these will be, I believe, familiar to you. So I want to start as we normally do. I'll read through the psalm, and then we'll go through it. And But we're going to look at both these psalms. They're both very short, and they're yeah. both psalms of ascent. So let's start with Psalm 127, a song of ascent of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, an offspring of reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. So that's Psalm 127. Let's now uh, take a look at, uh, go back over it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the first part of verse 1, a song of ascents of Solomon. But one thing different in this, obviously this would be something that you would sing with your family on your way to church. So it's appropriate to talk about the family as you're preparing and what God says about family. So both your biological family and your spiritual family, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. But notice it's of Solomon. Um, Solomon, the wisest person that lived at the, in that day. Um, there were days in his life he wasn't very wise, especially when he had all those 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand total. I don't even know how he even knew everybody's name, but that's beside the point. He obviously writes this when he's being wise. Um, and so he writes, unless the Lord builds the house. Isn't that interesting? Unless the Lord builds the house. And Solomon's the one that's going to build the temple. Solomon's going to build his own palace that is magnificent. Remember all the years it took to build these things. Uh, and he's basically saying, if the Lord isn't the builder, it's not going to do so well. Yeah. Um, the builders labor in vain. Now, the question is, what is he talking about here? Is he talking about physical work? Or is he talking about the house is in the house of your family? Or the house of God's family, the, uh, like the temple? So again, he echoes that unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. I found this uh, comment that I thought was helpful. It's a Latin motto. It says, and I'm not going to say it right because I'm a Greek guy, a Hebrew guy, but I'm not a Latin guy. So, nisi domini nus frusta. It says it comes from the first words of the psalm and means without the Lord, frustration. It is the motto of the city of Edinburgh, Scotland, appearing on its crest, and it's affixed to the city's official documents. It could have be attached to the lives of many who are trying to live their lives without the Almighty. Without the Lord is frustration. Yes. Um, or as in our psalm translation, it's vanity. It's vain. You don't do anything. There was a great, great article in the Sioux City Journal today, this morning, I got up and read it about one of our members at Calvary. Um, her name is Holly Duax. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a great article. I wish everybody could read it. And 
it said that uh, she had an injury and she felt terrible that she couldn't run seven days a week. Well, maybe running seven days a week isn't such a good thing because after she found out about the, the injury, she had to take four weeks off and then she ends up running records after it. Now this should teach you something. Um, and it's a lesson that I had to learn as a, a kid. I used to work, uh, have an ethic like that where you work six, seven days a week and you become less effective. Um, in fact, one of the one of my professors uh, invited another professor to come and visit our college and talk about rest. And not just physical rest, but spiritual rest, taking time out with the Lord. And I was absolutely amazed what happens when you do that. You become faster, you become stronger, um, you become more well-centered because the Lord begins to build in your life. Now, it doesn't seem to be logical, but the way God designed us, it actually works. So for example, I remember back in my weight training days, I don't look like a big, strong um, person, but I actually used to lift weights and I swam and um, was very competitive back in my day. Um, but the my coaches always says you don't lift the same weights uh, day after day. You have to rotate because your muscles have to repair themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need that time of rest. And as they heal, as you go back out, they become stronger. But if you never allow them to heal, um, you're, you're laboring in vain. Um, and it's the same way if you don't make God a part of things. Um, you might be successful on earth, but, or you might not, you may be more successful. You put the Lord in, even in the physical aspects of life. Okay, so uh, Spurgeon, Spurgeon, you know, I've kind of come to like some of his insights as we've been doing this study. I found this quote from him. He says, note that the psalmist does not bid the builder cease from laboring, nor suggest that the watchmen should neglect their duty, nor that men should show their trust in God by doing nothing. <laughs> Nay, he supposes that they will do all that they can do, and then he forbids their fixing their trust in what they have done, and assures them that all creature effort will be in vain unless the cre creator puts forth his power. Isn't that a good quote? Um, Unless the Lord builds his, the house, the builders labor in vain. So he doesn't say don't stop laboring. Mm -hmm. It just says the Lord ought to be the builder. Uh, he's the architect. He's the builder. We do the, the labor. <laughs> but he's the builder. And I, I think that's, that's a really big, he built us. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's the word in Genesis Chapter one, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, but God then took uh, and made Adam or built him out of the, the dust of the earth. So God is the builder, whether you want him to be or not, he was, you wouldn't be here. And our Psalm, uh, what is it? Uh, one, we're gonna look at it a little bit later but uh, God knit us together in our mother's womb, Psalm 139. So we got that one to look forward to. Okay, so verse two, can I have a reader? Verse two, do you want to read, Carol? I'll, I'll get you working or is your allergies getting you too much? In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants to those he loves. Okay, so more vanity here. You rise early, stay up late. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about. You can do all the, you can put the work in, you can toil, but if you don't have the Lord with it, it's gonna be pointless. Mm -hmm. um, think about this. If you don't have the Lord, 
do you really have any purpose in your life other than it's like spinning your wheels you become a hamster on a a wheel doing the motions and what's ironic is god is using your labor you're benefiting others but you have no clue what it's all about uh god put you here on purpose and if you recognize that he's building and you allow him to build in your life you become even more effective i can't imagine life without yeah yeah i just don't know what people i don't know it just doesn't seem yeah and and i think of so many people i've read stories that have just worked and worked and worked and burnt themselves out and you go what were they doing it for just to have a a big old house to have the best stuff but they never enjoy it because they're always working Um, i always say people i won't go by these houses and see mm -hmm. these nice patios out there you know behind the house or and I think, boy, those those would be nice for rest of them. But you never see anybody. Yeah, no one's them. in them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're all working. To, yeah, yeah. Hey, I've been doing a uh, uh, was part of a Bible study uh, down in Omaha. It's been a couple of years before the pandemic happened, and we spent a lot of time looking at uh, work and rest, the balance between the two. So, for example, when you, uh, even when God created the world, what did he start with? You start with rest at night, Mm -hmm. and then you look it up sometime. There was evening, and then there was morning and the new day. It always starts with evening. And what is evening? Rest. And what is rest? Being in God. And then the day, you work after you rest. You don't work and then rest. You rest and then you work. And then you rest again. And then at the end of the week, you take time out with God to rest with him. And in fact, it says, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And there's a little flag on the play, as I like to call it. It's got that little A there, some of your Bibles. And this is the NIV. And But this could also mean he grants food um, to those he loves. In other words, um, he takes care, but be real careful. This doesn't mean sit around and do nothing. Um, after all, look at Proverbs 6. Uh, do you want to read that, Howard? Uh, Proverbs 6, 6 to 11. I printed it there for you right on your sheet. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, you got it. Right there, yeah. yeah, go right oh, ahead. Oh, okay. That was nice. I looked it up for you. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. (laughs) That is pretty uh, indicting. So in other words, don't read this psalm and say, well, I'm going to do nothing then. Yeah. That, that's not the point. The point is build your house with the Lord, um, rest in him, but you're going to do hard work. You're going to be like this ant, like this uh, that stores up food when they can. And, and that's good. So and of course in a farming community you know exactly what he's talking about here if you're if you've got a big old farm um, even 80 acres and you've got a nice day out and you just sit on your hands well guess what you're going to be poor (laughs) because you're not going to have a crop Uh, or if you've got a nice day and everything is all ready to harvest you sit on your hands you're going to be poor. It doesn't mean, this verse from Proverbs doesn't mean you're not going to rest. It just means you're going to work when you're able to work and you're going to rest when you're able to rest. It's a, it's kind of this balance in life. So I printed for you a number of verses and 
these are uh, in an I'm doing another Bible study. Sorry about that, Howard. That's okay. But uh, on the book of Mark, so I've been reading through Mark uh, lately, and there's some great passages in Mark and Luke for that matter as well. So Jesus. I always call Mark the boom, boom gospel, <laughs> because it just goes boom, boom, right from one thing to the well, next. He doesn't linger on very no, much. No, nothing. He, he's not a long-winded, right? Nope, he's not long-winded. He just goes right from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. Jesus is preaching. Jesus chooses disciples. Jesus heals somebody. <laughs> Jesus done this, and bang, Jesus rests. <laughs> he does get in trouble once in a while. With Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, in, so Jesus prays early in the morning before he starts the day. And then in chapter six, uh, right be, after he feeds the 5,000, it's been, could you imagine feeding probably 20,000 people? And basically the disciples, they don't get it. So Jesus is doing all the work. Um, they just kind of hand it out. And then they collect all this. And he's been teaching and he's been healing. Well, what do you think Jesus is going to do? So he goes off and he prays on the mountain. Um, and then what does he do? Disciples go off on their own and they do their own thing. And, and while they're up on the, he's up on the mountain. He, I think he realizes he knows, needs to go check on these disciples. So they're out in the boat and he walks by on the water. It's, it's great. Um, Mary and Martha, look, look at them. Uh, notice Martha's working really hard. Mary, what does she do? She sits at the feet yeah. of Jesus and learns from him. And what does Jesus say? Mary has chosen what is better. It's not that Martha's working and it's taking nice. care of their food needs isn't important. It's just that the balance is right. Mm -hmm. um, he, she allows the builder of the universe to build in her life. Um, and then the last one I picked there is Luke 6, 12. This is right before Jesus chooses his apostles, but he goes up on the mountain, prays, and then comes down and picks the 12 apostles. Uh, again, balance. He goes, he wouldn't have had to because he's God, but he does it for our benefit. He consults with God and then he acts. Um, and I, I think that's the building aspect. Uh, he's going to build the family of God, but he starts with prayer. Um, I have a, in our church body, we have a, it's called an, a district office. This gets complicated, but in the district office, they have people that help with missions and help yeah. with stewardship and yeah. things like that. But our uh, mission executive, he's really big on this, but he says, how are you going to um, do this mission? And he doesn't say, um, how are you going to go do it? He says, how are you going to start by praying for it? He always says, pray first. And he's right. Mm -hmm. You're not going to build the church by you doing. Start by asking God to build and then go do the work. Um, and he's absolutely right. Start with the Lord. Okay. And the same with our family as well, as we're going to see here. You want to build a family? Start with with prayer. You want to uh, read there? Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows, arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Okay. So. <laughs> so now we're kind of getting into the house. You know, you build a house out of stone. You can build it. Now we're talking about a a house, a, a family. You're going to pass on what you believe. This word heritage is kind of interesting. So what is our heritage that we want to, we want to leave, but notice what the Lord's heritage is in us. It's the children. So our children are not our heritage, but it's a gift from God. Can I just say yeah. something that came to mind that when you were saying Solomon had 600, 700, 700 <laughs> don't you think this was one of God's plans to, to populate the world? We had to have more children to get the world expanded. 
Well, if he didn't want him to, he wouldn't. Have. I think he was just. Yeah. Sinning. Yeah, he was. He was definitely sinning. Now, sometimes, yeah, you're right. He did fill the earth with, um, so that they could subdue it. But remember what David did. Some of the same stupid stuff. He got married to all these women. Um, I don't. If you look it up, at first he's got one, and then he's got two, and then I think by the end he said about five. And what ends up happening? They all die. They uh, Absalom oh, no. does some murdering of his own brothers, and it's just nasty. Um, and then Solomon, a lot of his family doesn't make it either. Um, it's it's bad. In fact, almost none of Solomon's kids are mess mentioned other than uh, Solomon Rehoboam and and obviously he's going to go on but what happened to the rest of them <laughs> I think they died um, all this fighting and it's just awful um, they weren't a very good heritage in, in fact you want to talk about irony Solomon writes this beautiful psalm about children being a heritage from the Lord, and he doesn't even raise his own children in the faith. Look what happens to his own son. He's bad. Um, he has a little bit of the faith, but it's very distant. So if, if you look at our own lives and say, oh, we're so much worse than him, uh, Psalm had it really bad. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> And, but it's interesting, they are a reward, and even Rehoboam ends up being the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, despite his horridness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, just, yeah. That came into my mind. No, it is, it's interesting <laughs> to think about, and God uses even bad situations like yeah. Solomon's family. Yeah. Um, he uses bad situations like uh, Abraham, boy, good grief, he slept with Hagar, and then they end up with that whole mess, and then they're fighting for the rest of eternity on earth uh, between Ishmael's offspring and, and the chosen people, and they claim the Muslim God, a lot of Ishmaelites. Yeah, it's, it's just messy even still today. Okay, got this quote from a commentary by the name of Clark. He says, let the fruitful family, uh, however poor, lay this to heart. Children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. And he who gave them will feed them. Um, for it is a fact, and a maxim formed on it has never failed. Wherever God sends mouse, he sends meat. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting i i mean you could probably argue in ethiopia from time to time there wasn't meat for them to <laughs> eat they were doing good to get rice and water so i don't know um, that but it is true god does provide uh, maybe not meat like this quote says but he does provide what we ultimately need um, so the, the reward of the womb here I also found a nice quote. This is from that enduring word commentary, uh, but arrows. And I, I've heard this before, but it was good to be reminded of it. What is an arrow? They must be carefully shaped and formed. Obviously, we're talking about the kids. They must be guided with skill and strength. They must be given care or they will not fly straight. And when I was... Uh, in Lamar's, Iowa, I got to play dart ball. If you've ever played that, even if you've never done darts, mm -hmm. and they have real feathers mm -hmm. on the end. So they're like arrows. It's amazing. If you get one little feather out of whack, it sends that, that little dart the wrong direction. Yeah. They got to be totally straight. Mm -hmm. So they would, they would care for those little feathers on the end because they give it, it's kind of like an airplane. If you turn the, uh, the rudder and the 
the Ale alerons, I can't pronounce it right. And if you change them, it goes different directions. It's that little adjustment makes so a big you throw with the difference. Ball, you hold the ball for in your hand and throw it? No, nope, you. Uh, the way darts are thrown, you could do it overhand yeah, like yeah. this, okay. but uh, dart ball oh, is dart underhanded. Ball is underhanded. And those are the ones that are oh. used real uh, oh, feathers. And I so, yeah, the, they're quite interesting, but they're very, very accurate when, when it's, everything's it right. <laughs> when everything's straight, they fly oh, straight oh, too. Um, it says they must be aimed in given direction. They will not find direction on their own. And this is a good point that uh, probably a lot of parents could learn. You can't just say, well, I'll let them make decisions on their own someday. Because yeah. if you do that, you've sent them off to live that way. I mean, they will make decisions, but probably not the best. Um, and there's always gonna be exceptions, even with, with arrows. You can have it perfect and send it out and it, it does something different than you told it to do. Um, and they are, in some respects, only launched once. <laughs> um, sometimes they come back. We should have put the boomerang on there. Sometimes they were like boomerangs. They are an extension of the warrior's strength and accomplishment. They have potential for much good or evil. That's, that's interesting, kind of like an arrow. Yeah. They can do good, they can do evil. Um, and I just got done doing a, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of marriage preparation lately. And part of my marriage preparation is I go through on raising children. I've always felt this is an important study to do with with uh, young new uh, couples that are about to get married. And I like to cite a study that was done in Switzerland back in 1994. And I'll just give you a couple pieces out of that. In that particular study, it talked about bringing, uh, training up your children in the way they should go so that they will not depart from it. If the husband and the wife work together on bringing their children to church, uh, like 30% of those kids would continue in regular worship after they would leave the house. Um, like 40% would continue irregular. In other words, almost 70% would uh, continue in the faith. If, and obviously the rest would not at all. So there's always some that even though you raise them right, they don't. Then it went on, and I'm just going to give you a couple of the statistics, but if the mom alone raised them in the faith and the dad did not, only about 3% of them would continue in regular worship. Um, about 30 or 40% would be regular, and then the rest would not come at all. And it was very thorough. I'm just giving you a couple highlights. The, uh, if the husband raised the child alone and the wife was an atheist, mm. it would go up to like 40% of those kids would continue regular in worship and almost as high as if both parents raised them together, almost as high. It's always better if both are together. Um, very, very interesting study. Um, goes to show if dad um, raises them in the faith, they will follow dad. Even if, if dad is irregular, they'll be, uh, but it's, it's interesting. Um, and that's kind of the spiritual head of the household where the husband leads makes a big difference. But I always tell women though, don't not, if, if your husband won't, you, you still need to be the head of the household and lead um, because otherwise they'll have no chance. Um, to hear God's word. And, and I always cite those statistics too. If you look at them, even where just the wife does it, still, you've got a number of them continuing in the faith. Um, so it isn't a given 
it isn't a given. You sh shouldn't read statistics and say, well, all's lost <laughs> and throw up your hands and not do the work, kind of like what we're talking about here. Because ultimately it comes down unless the Lord builds the house, the labor labors in vain. So you still want to do it even if the marriage isn't perfect um, to keep praying, keep continuing um, to love them. So, but again, they do have potential for good and evil alike, but it, it's just fascinating mm -hmm. how important it is, if possible, to have the couple work together praying for those children and build, build the house. Okay, let me go back to our PowerPoint here. So any thoughts on that, the, this whole idea of arrows? Isn't, it's interesting that they use the word arrow for kids here. Um, well, arrows must have meant different than, than what they do now, you know. Yeah. Like we would think of an arrow as something you're hunting with or something, where they were thinking in the terms of children. You know? Well, I think they, an arrow was what you hunt with. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a powerful metaphor, yeah. yeah, for a child that they're a, straight on. Yeah, yeah. You want them to be. We even say it sometimes. We want them to live the straight and narrow path. You know. But you know, it's a, a couple of nineteen-year-old kids all of a sudden have a baby, mm -hmm. and you know, then we're talking about rules and regulations of raising this baby and these two are just trying to these two young people just trying to live their life as best they can they know nothing about raising a baby and it doesn't come with a book no so no. and i could not imagine going to like a job and they said yeah you're hired here's your office i would see you later and you having nothing, no, not knowing what in the heck is going on. You just couldn't run a company like that. Yeah, exactly. And, and as, as raising children is hard work. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's one of the points of this psalm. Remember, if you're singing this while you're going up to the temple, yeah. And this is why it's so important to realize we're we don't we're not just our little nuclear family, but we're talking about the whole family of God is is meant to be there for you as well they aren't always but this, this is probably why they would sing it as a group as a reminder hey i'm supposed to help look out for these others look at what jesus did when they were raising him they bring him to the temple yeah. and he goes off on his own teaching and they don't even know he's gone <laughs> uh, and i think the reason is because he's part of the larger family and so this isn't a big deal to them that he might be walking with the cousins or with the aunts and uncles. And um, it's in the United States of America, 20th, first century, we're more nuclear family oriented or segmented. So for example, I live with my father and mother and kids and that's family, but they wouldn't view it that way. They would view it extended family and aunts and uncles and all the kids. So not that you wouldn't do things with your immediate family, mm -hmm. but it was much more broad, this idea of family. And in the same way with our church, yeah. um, it, it's, it's kind of that broad family. These, this is my mother and brothers and sisters mm -hmm. um, all together. So I could call all of you today, uh, brothers, mothers, just like Jesus did. <coughs> okay. Um, let's look at the last verses here. Uh, mm -hmm. Diane, you want to read uh, the uh, verse five? Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Okay, isn't that interesting? So a quiver full of kids. <laughs> Can't just have one arrow. You got to have lots of them. And of course, like our family, I can't have more than a two. It was God ordained that from the beginning. We physically couldn't have more. Um, so it's, as a result, I got a whole bunch at church <laughs> to raise. So 
They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Um, and I think this, you can kind of understand it just, just right out. Well, when you have kids, they'll be there for you later on. I mean, it's, it's kind of the point. Um, they might not be there when they're 20, but as, as they grow, they will be there. Um, here's a couple notes I found. Again, I cite this Spurgeon fellow. It says a quiver may be small and yet full, and then the blessing is obtained. In any case, we may be sure that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of children that he possesseth. That's interesting. Not in the abundance of children. So where is your real, the strength of your life in? Not just in your children, but in the Lord. Yeah, that's kind of his point. So don't get overly caught up in this and go, oh, woe is me. I didn't have a lot of children. So therefore, I'm not good. Because um, remember what God said about the widow or the and the uh, barren woman. Blessed is the barren woman. Remember, we, we can't just. Um, I yeah, know. Say that uh, you know because she's barren, she's not, yeah, and she's not worthy. Not worthy, yeah. Well, look at Rachel and Leah. Leah was able to have a lot of kids. Rachel didn't have everybody, but it says the Lord remembered Rachel and she was able to have. The, and she had it when she was. Yeah, older. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting. Another quote I remember a great man coming into my house at Waltham and seeing all my children standing in order of their age and stature, said, These are they that make rich men poor. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But we straight receive this answer. No, my Lord, these are they that make a poor man rich. For there is not one of these whom we would part with for all your wealth. Isn't that interesting? Um, we, we joke about that, that kids make us poor. Or, or people joke about that, that they make you rich because they're all tax ex, uh, exemptions. Uh, right now, it's good to have children. Boy, they make your taxes smaller. <laughs> but but that's not what it's about. Rich and hard. Yeah, exactly. Um, the last one he has is many children make many prayers, and many prayers bring many bless much blessing. Boy, I pray a lot with my kids. Uh, you know, you pull your hair out sometimes, but you do yeah. get to pray. Gray hair. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, First Timothy 5, 4 to 8. You probably all heard this passage, but it says, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to the to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. This is interesting because you would think these uh, young children in their 30s, 40s, 50s would know to take care of their parents, but apparently they didn't. So it goes to show they're supposed to be arrows and they're supposed to do the right thing, but sometimes even good arrows need a little... Uh, encouragement. Or push. Yeah, or push. Uh, look at the rest of the verse. But mm -hmm. the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Whoa. And we think, you know, you, a lot of people think that today is isn't bad with families and stuff, and but they had their yeah they had their back struggle in those too. Days too. Yeah, so it goes to show you're raising your children, you're singing this psalm while you're on the road. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor labors in vain. It goes to show you gotta all lifelong, even once they get older, to remind them. Mm -hmm. That the Lord still needs to build the house. And one of the ways he builds in families is he uses these children to take care of their uh, loved ones. I don't remember who told me this, but he says, when, when you're young, your parents take care of you. 
when you're old, you take care of your parents. Um, and my family's very, very good. Yeah, that's wonderful. That is wonderful yeah. that way. Yeah. And then in between, they forget. <laughs> so they never did. That, that is good. Not always going to church, but they family. Yep. And hopefully keep praying for them that they they will return because just like and we're seeing in the scriptures, they don't always do the right thing. And my son, there. Mark, my oldest, Sunday was here and I was talking about the TV show about all the animals and how sitting there watching it on Saturday and the color and all these different animals and they act in different ways and how, how did God know how to create all these and and well, he's God, that's why. And my son said, well, there, of course God did it. And, and uh, people who don't believe that there is a God, he said, I don't know where they're at because who would, who, how would we have this earth? And he <laughs> went on and on and on. And I thought, oh, Mark, I finally see a side of you. I, I wasn't <laughs> sure it was there. I hoped, I thought it was, but yeah. Did you bring him a donut? Um, did you bring him a donut that day? I did. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's I mean, good. I, you just never know when their faith pops out and you find. I don't know how people out. can think that yep. we just popped into I know. existence. Well, I got one son that kind of thinks that, but the yeah. rest of them all. No. Well, let's uh, let's read Psalm 128. And I'm going to just go through this. This one won't take us long. It has some of the exact same points as the previous one. Um, you're going to kind of see as you, you would sing this on your way to uh, how that goes. So here it goes. A song, oops, a song of ascents. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace. Be on Israel. Okay, well, let's go back through this. This one's, a, I have a little bit less notes on it, so it'll, we'll go quicker. But notice again, and it's not wrong that it says man. Do you see what he's doing? The head of the household, just like I mentioned in the, the previous psalm, the man is supposed to raise the child up. And so he's really hitting him hard to do it. Um, because God designed it this way. And again, if you don't have a man doing it, the wife has to take the place and step up and, and be the leader. But notice, blessed are all who fear the Lord. So fear. Um, and this is one of the big deals that it talks about in uh, the uh, uh, Martin Luther when he was writing about the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. I have that on your screen or on your sheet there. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote the meaning of this is we should fear, love, and trust God above all things. So fear is part of that. Um, this isn't a, a fear as in being afraid of God, no, but of, uh, reverence. of reverence, of awe, of, of realizing God could destroy me, but I, I'm in awe of him and I need him. And how could anyone not want him? Or as Spurgeon writes, it's idle to talk about fearing the Lord if we act like those who have no care whether there be a God or not. God's ways will be our ways if we have sincere reverence for him. If the heart is joined unto God, the feet will follow hard after him. Um, in other words, what is in your heart what is in your head will move to your heart, will move to your hands and feet and life. So it can't just stay in one's mind. It, it moves um, throughout. Okay, verse two, we will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessing and prosperity will be yours. So what's the point? 
Jesus said it a little bit differently. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So if you put God first, if kind of like in the previous psalm, if you build, the Lord builds the house, well, what'll happen? He'll take care of the rest. Uh, you're going to have blessing and prosperity. Yeah, he will take care of you in life. The opposite's also true. Look at Genesis 3.17 there. Then, he, then to Adam, um, God said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, saying you shall not to eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return." See, if they had just built on the Lord, they wouldn't even have to work. It would just be, they would just receive what the Lord gives. And it's, it's true today. We, we have to work. There's going to be a sweat of the brow. Could you imagine before then, you wouldn't even have to sweat. You just pick the fruit and enjoy <laughs> it. Uh, but now you got to work to get it. Um, but thank God that he still allows us to be blessed, even despite the curse. Um, isn't that that interesting? Uh, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Uh, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. So this one, um, I was reading a commentary on it, and it said that uh, the fruitful vine could refer to one of two things. It can refer to having children, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, but it could refer to sexual charm. Um, and then, uh, of course, children are going to be the, the results of that. But then I was thinking about this. Is it just talking about that? Remember, we always say Jesus is always the, uh, also the meaning of each one of these psalms. And obviously, this is talking about family, but about your spiritual family. Well, what's going to happen if Jesus is your vine? Remember, I am the true vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Well, if Jesus is in us, he's going to produce fruit. And literally, children that grow in him in our own family, but also the children that we work on in our spiritual family, because we're raising up children even as we speak. I know, Diane, you help with that and with these families. And you, we always pray, Lord... Uh, work in the lives of these young ones and, and grow them. But he's, he's at work there as well. And he's sustaining us and building us there also. So I think there's kind of a double thing going on in this psalm. Um, and same way in the previous one, you build the house of the Lord. You build your own house on the Lord. And then the last of the psalm is simply a blessing. Yes, this will be a, the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And may you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. So what's the blessing here? Watch your kid. <laughs> yeah. So one of the best blessings you have for this man is having... A wife and children. Mm -hmm. And also having your church family mm -hmm. and the children there as well. Um, and again, this we want to read this real quick and read the word man out of it. But I'm saying that's actually in the Bible on purpose that way to encourage young men to actually take their responsibility. Um, our, our society is, is pushed for so long to bring women up, and some of that's very good, but sometimes it leaves the men and says, well, if society is gonna push women to do all this stuff, I'm gonna just sit back and do nothing. <laughs> and that's not right. No. 
young men need to actually stand up and make a living and and be strong spiritual leaders that's and look what will happen if they do it <laughs> they will get to see their children's children um, they'll see the results and i know there's always exceptions um, because you could be a godly man and your children could go off the deep end um, and you go well why well then then I always say, well, look at Adam and Eve. They raised two fine young men, Cain and Abel. And what happened? One murders the other. And you go, what? Didn't they raise them the same? Probably did. But one went haywire. And that's called sin. So, and praise God, that brings us back to Jesus. We need him again. Um, so, well, let's close, close with a prayer. Lord, thank you for these two Psalms as we look at family and our spiritual family. And we know these, that we need you and to begin with fear and loving you and also building with you. Lord, sometimes our building doesn't turn out so well. And so forgive us for that and, um, and help us to rely even more on your building in our life and forgiving and renewing and um, starting over anew. Thank you for our study today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you all. This has been kind of fascinating. I hope you have a wonderful Easter. Uh, good Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, and get to celebrate what the Lord has done.